All right, Krishna, everyone, this is Achuta Bhava, and today is Bhakti Wednesday. So I'm making another episode to talk about the wisdom of the Bhakti Yoga tradition. And in this video, we're going to be talking about six things that can kill your vibe. And by that, I mean, kill the, the good benefits and the positive vibration of a spiritual practice. So we're going to take this. This is the second passage from a book that I started working on last week with you guys called The Nectar of Instruction. And the second text goes like this. Atyahara prayashyascha prajalpo niyamagraha jana sangyascha laulyam cha sabdir sadbir bhaktir vinashati. One's devotional service is spoiled when they become too entangled in the following six activities eating more than necessary or collecting more money than necessary, uh, over endeavoring for mundane things that are difficult to get, talking unnecessarily about earthly subject matters that don't really matter. Uh, practicing scriptural rules or spiritual regulations and practices for the sake of following rules, not for the sake of actually growing, uh, rejecting or rejecting any kind of rule or practice and being uh, so independent that you make everything up on your own. You don't listen to any wisdom tradition whatsoever. Five, associated with people who do not have a focus on spiritual matters and six, being greedy for uh, worldly achievement. So that's just my breakdown of the text. I'm kind of changing the language a little bit to be like more up with our modern vernacular, but that is the gist of these six instructions. So let's go over them one by one and talk about how each of these things can kill our vibe. Now, please understand that these are things that I, you know, I aim for, but do not achieve. I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, you know, suggest that we act like perfectionists or that we act self-righteous or that we spend our time in spiritual life trying to become better than other people or something like that. There can be um, a weird like spiritual, you know, egoism that we develop in trying to follow practices like this and trying to taking some kind of pride in them or something like that. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about things that we endeavor for quietly in our hearts that we try to stay mindful of in a humble everyday kind of way. So let's talk about them. One, don't eat too much. <laughs> it sounds weird, but actually, if you're in a prayerful meditative practice every day where you're trying to commune with the soul, the self, source, God, and you're trying to forge that connection in the heart, but you're stuffing more food than you actually need into your body. We're not talking about being some kind of ascetic or renouncing food. We're just saying, don't eat too much. I think that um, obesity is one of the world's greatest epidemics now. And there's so many factors that go in and I'm not into blaming people for any of their vices, whether they're a drug addict or, I mean, there's a lot of suffering out there and there's a lot of complex reasons societally that go into an atmosphere that's conducive to suffering. So not trying to place any blame on anyone, but a simple thing is that your mind, our minds are a lot clearer and the spiritual benefits of our daily practices are going to be um, much easier to, to feel the benefits of if we are not oversaturating or like over digesting things. So you don't, you don't want your mind to be the result of your food all the time. And that's kind of what it is in a sense, if we're always eating or we're just, you know, we're, we're eating too much. In other words, um, I'm not a dietary expert. It's just a simple, this is 500 years old, this text, right? So it's even maybe 600 at this point. But it's simply saying, just if you want to kill the vibe, eat too much. Uh, if you want to keep the, the vibe of your spiritual practice, be careful about not eating too much. That's the first one. The other one is about trying to earn too much money. It doesn't say don't earn any money. It doesn't say you can't uh, be into spiritual life and be a business owner or that you couldn't be into spiritual life and you know be concerned about turning a profit so that you can pay your mortgage or whatever the case might be. Um, but it's about over endeavoring to be rich, that kind of thing, like greed, money, gr greed for more than a, a person really needs. Um, you know, I see there are many people in the, for example, one thing that I was always impressed me is George Harrison from the Beatles, who was doing so well, gave a lot of his money to help build uh, bhakti yoga communities because he was really into bhakti yoga in the 60s and throughout his life was very generous with his money. Uh, and uh, benefits and things like that. So sometimes people also come into wealth or are gen just naturally successful, in which case I've heard my guru say many times, are you using what you've been given in service? 
You don't need to live some kind of crazy, lavish lifestyle. Um, using what you have constructively to serve others. It's that greed for more than we really need. So number two is over endeavoring for worldly things that are difficult to obtain. I want a Lamborghini. That's really hard to get, but I really want it. Or do you know what I mean? So anything that would be like some kind of pinnacle worldly achievement that really doesn't matter. It's really not a part of the advancement of your spiritual life. Advancement maybe is too heavy a word. The development, the cultivation, the nurturing of your soul. If we spend too much time working, working, working for things that really don't matter and are really difficult to get, that can really kill our vibe. Number three, talking necess- unnecessarily about worldly subject matters that don't really that don't matter that much. For me, for example, that's definitely sports. Like that is. You want me to get hung up on a whole bunch of jibber jabber that really doesn't matter. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to diss athletes, right? Everyone's mundane subject matter probably looks very different. Some people are, their dharma is to be an athlete and they, their spiritual life happens in and through their, that career, just as much as mine happens in and through the career of an astrologer or whatever it is. But my point is that there are going to be some subject matters for us that really are, you know, like gossip column stuff. It's just, pointless material that we spin our wheels in that really doesn't do anything for us. I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not trying to define what is unnecessary only to say that every person probably knows what it is inside of themselves. That something that, is it cultivating something? Is it growing something? Is it nurturing something that's good inside of you? Is it cultivating heart, love, soul? Those are the kinds of subject matters we want to spend our time talking about and entertaining and putting into our mind. The other stuff, can kill your vibe. Number four, practicing spiritual or scriptural practices, rules, regulations, anything like that for the sake of following rules and not for the sake of actually growing or transforming our consciousness or rejecting rules altogether and saying, I just do my own thing. Equally troublesome. So in this case, we have two instructions. One is you can kill your vibe if you do spiritual things just for the sake of following rules. If you practice meditation, because I like following rules, if you uh, don't eat too much, but because I just like following rules, or do you see what I mean? This is a specific teaching that says anything that you're doing spiritually, that's just being done for the sake of some kind of obsession about rules that will kill your vibe. That will not help you grow. And it can actually sort of stunt your growth spiritually. And then on the flip side, people who say, I don't need any rules, any guidance, any higher authority to tell me what might help someone to teach me how to meditate, someone to give me advice on prayer, someone to give me advice on lifestyle, following wisdom traditions, sages, people who have been here and done things before I have. I reject all of it because I'm sovereign, baby. You know, <laughs> like no one tells me what to do, but me, you know, uh, understandably we have at times all probably many of us have been hurt by the uh, abuses of power within religious institutions, academic institutions. And we also live in a modern day and age where there's a lot of suspicion about government and there's suspicion about higher authority figures, a lot of corruption, a lot of power resides in a very few amount of people. So there's natural skepticism about authority figures, understandably. At the same time, to think that thousands and thousands of years of human history, that we have nothing to learn from our elders in terms of the people who have gone before us, what they've tried, what has helped them and what has hindered them when it comes to the development of our spirituality, that rejecting all of it and just working independently and not taking advice from anyone about how to um, practice spiritual life will kill your vibe. It will kill your vibe because you won't even probably be able to establish one. Sometimes people, it's not to say that you can't come up with anything on your own either, but it is to say people who act whimsically and just won't follow any advice or rules or suggestions from people who are wiser, who have walked the path longer than they have or prior to them, uh, they're going to, they're going to get into trouble. Number five, associating with worldly minded people who are not interested in spirituality. So on this front, it's very similar. It's like saying uh, to talking about worldly things like, look, there's going to be people in your life that the t- bind, the binds of the ties of fate have bound you to the cords of fate. 
And they're, they're not necessarily going to be people that you sit down and, you know, talk about great ideas with, or talk about your inner life with, you know, they're going to be people that you've known maybe since the second grade or family members or whoever you share some things in common and Hey, it's enough. And you, you care about each other and you love each other and you have fun or whatever. But as we progress in spiritual life, one of the instructions that's very clear in the Bhakti wisdom tradition is be careful because, uh, Karma is perpetuated by who and what we associate with, which means if we spend a lot of time with people who have zero interest in spiritual life or have no have not been cultivating an inner life, it may not look the same as ours, may not be the same religious path or share exactly the same beliefs, but you know what, what it's like to be around someone who is consciously developing an inner life. It, let's put it even on that level. What to speak of, you know, the importance of having at least some people in our lives who literally share some similar practices, values, beliefs. So this teaching is saying easy way to kill your vibe, go hang out with people who want nothing to do with spirituality. And then finally says being greedy for mundane achievements, which is sort of similar to um, over endeavoring for material things that are very difficult to obtain. The first one is a little bit more like, I want a Lamborghini. The second one is a little bit more like, I want to get a PhD and become a CEO or something like that, or win a gold medal, or it's like achievements worldly. Like I've developed skill or mastery, or I'm recognized socially. I've won a Pulitzer or something like that. Be careful of those things, those desires, because they'll also kill your vibe. Um, you know, and they're, they're everywhere. You know what I mean? It's easy to want a pat on the back. You know, I find myself doing this. Oh, you know, I'm making some really good videos. It feels like it's good spiritual content. I hope my viewership goes up, pat, 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 you know, like it's, it's subtle. It can, it can sneak in anywhere. So just staying on top of it and being like, look, I'm doing whatever I'm called to do, serving whatever capacity I'm meant to serve in my job and my relationships and so forth. And I'm not doing any of it because I'm trying to get some kind of achievement or cosmic thumbs up and approval and that boosts my ego. I serve to serve and the benefit of serving is serving. And so it's its own joy. We have sometimes we have to develop a taste for it because it's not like we naturally love just being a humble servant of other people with our talents and skills. Uh, you know, and humble doesn't mean that you're just behind the scenes either. I mean, some people their humble path might be to um, you know be in movies or something like that. I've met actually when I was living in New York City and I started my career. I've, done, uh, I won't give away names, but I've done charts of a number of different celebrities that everyone would recognize. And in working for some people, I can tell you that like, just because people are in movies doesn't mean they aren't very humble, decent, um, people of real integrity. There's sometimes there's like a, a thing that suggests that any kind of accomplishment that is on the main stage in life must imply that the person has this ruthless drive for approval or for, um, you know, the need for fame or something like that. Some people are famous because they're really good at things and they're not necessarily attached to the fame. They're still very humble people. Again, one of my favorite examples, at least at times in his life, because I don't know his whole life, you know, but one of the things that George Harrison, someone who's really into bhakti yoga was celebrated for was here's a celebrity who's a musical icon. Yet he's a very humble person who's really in love with God and pours that into his music. And, you know, you think, wouldn't the fame go to the, his head or whatever, but any degree, my point is to say achievements themselves are not bad. It's the greed or the hunger for some kind of achievement that will give me something right that we have to be careful of. And it can sneak in anywhere. It can sneak in even to like charitable work. Oh, I want to do good things in the world. I want to save the world and make it a better place. And, um, Look at how great I am for doing those things. You know, it's sometimes it, come, it can come in like that. And it's also not black and white. You know, sometimes you really, you want to do good and there's little elements, there's tinges of ego and egoic investment in it. We, we have so little patience sometimes. We're such black and white thinkers. We think, well, either a person is a sinner or they're a saint. They're either a fraud or they're legit. Most of us are some combination of both in just about every area of our life. There's areas of, of our lives, our careers, our relationships where we are consistent and, and we show up with good character and virtues and stuff like that. And then there's, you know, there's tinges of like uh, falseness or ego or whatever. And there it's just, they're co-present. So um, I find that with any and all of these rules, they're just guidelines. They're just suggestions. If we receive them in a puritanical spirit, 
then it, it's, they often, they start to polarize us and then, you know, we can get in our heads about them. They're really just simple, simple suggestions. If we take them on a common sense level uh, are super helpful. So I hope you guys find this video interesting and useful today. Don't kill your vibe. One of the, my favorite analogies in Bhakti Yoga is the idea that as we're growing our spiritual life, um, that there's a creeper, like a little plant, and it's growing upward, like a vine wrapping slowly around a tree. The tree is God and the creepers, you know, tying itself closer and binding itself around God. But it's in the beginning, it's so fragile. And so, um, so, uh, you know, prone to perhaps getting stepped on and trampled on. And sometimes it's said that these kinds of things, as well as the propensity to criticize or gossip about other people is like setting a mad elephant loose in a garden where these, all these little baby creepers are trying to come up and grow. And, um, and so don't let the mad elephant loose. And these are some mad elephants, but also one I didn't add in there that's mentioned in many other places in the Bhakti tradition is the propensity to criticize other people, speak about them behind their back, especially to criticize people who are on a spiritual path. Remember this, anyone you know in your life who's on a spiritual path, who's even remotely trying to be on a spiritual path is someone that we should you know, we should pray for them and we should see them as people who have a lot to offer us and hold them in the light in our minds. No one's perfect, but when people are actively trying to have a spiritual life, the easiest way for them to succeed and for us to succeed in relation to them and their light is to um, forgive flaws and see good right? So it's especially important for the people in our lives who are spiritual because the people in our lives who are spiritual are like little orbs of light, little lanterns in the dark. And we need those nodes of light to be connected to our own light. Because when we see people like that, it, it creates other people seeing the best in us. And that's how we elevate those qualities and start letting go of things that aren't serving us or that aren't serving our you know, highest good or potential or whatever, or that aren't favorable for our spiritual growth. So see the good in others and they'll see it in you. And, and, but especially people in your life who are spiritual, be very careful with the propensity to criticize people who, you know, that are on a spiritual path. Uh, it, it might sound weird. Cause it's like, well, shouldn't we just not criticize anyone? And the answer is yes, but also be extra careful because the karmic backlash is particularly intense when we criticize people who are trying their best on a spiritual path, even if they have blemishes. Um, so at any rate, that was a little segue at the end there, but let's not kill the vibe. Let's keep the vibe going. So um, make sure you're chanting every day. If you haven't ever looked back at that mantra meditation video I made, it's super helpful to have a mantra meditation practice every day. Um, I'm actually going to be bringing on some teachers in the next month. Two of my teachers are offering a class on the Bhagavad Gita starting in January. I'll be having them come on and tell you about it. Um, and also another teacher, Rukmini Devi Dasi, uh, and my wife, Ashley will be talking about, um, the goddess and the role of the goddess and women in Bhakti in particular. So some cool stuff coming up from some of my other teachers in these Bhakti Wednesday videos. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys have a great week and until next week, Hare Krishna.